What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so we are continuing our uh, discussions on X-Men Disassembled, the return of X-Men Nate Gray. And in the last video, uh, we had talked about how Warren Worthington had basically been like transformed into Archangel, or I guess transformed back into Archangel. So to be honest here, when it comes to Archangel, he's more of like a holdover from fans who remember him from back in the day, but he's not like a powerful character, right? It's not like, you know, Warren Worthington became Archangel and then basically became God. It was nothing like that. He's just a holdover from, from people who love the X-Men comics back in the 90s, people who love things like X-Men, animated series and so on and so forth as a guy who's been reading x-men for 25 years he was never really important like he was never really that big of a deal <laughs> at least not to me anyway but uh but again like this kind of fight that takes place between magneto and and angel honestly it's kind of a fight that like Briston and, and, and Rosenberg and, and Kelly, they all kind of like nip in the butt. And the reason why is because under normal circumstances, Warren would be useless against uh, against Magneto because you're talking about a guy with metal wings fighting the master of magnetism. Now the fight kind of breaks out and, and it sort of unfolds. Magneto basically blocks the shots of, of Warren and then essentially says like, you guys have brought this all on yourselves. You guys are all doomed. Now, the other half of this is that with Warren, he's, he's no ally here. And this is kind of a return to familiarity. And the reason why was because after Warren became Archangel and then kind of went forward eventually he was released from the control of apocalypse but it was kind of like an existential crisis right like now that he's had this huge shift and this, this huge paradigm shift in who he is and it's like who is warren what's he about what does he stand for all that kind of good stuff and so he kind of left the x-men for like a while in this same scenario it's kind of unfolding again it's, it's sort of throwing comics back to the 1990s and saying well now he's kind of out there on his own angel stands alone now is really kind of his thing so he's not an ally of the x-men but he's not an enemy of the x-men he'll never go back to the way he was before at least that's kind of the indication as it's going on here and so from that point you know the x-men basically say okay fine if you're not going to do anything for us then at least show us where x mens operating out of and so that's when they basically give them the location now of course this fight this this little bit of a conflict goes exactly the way you would expect in the sense that like the main x-men roster shows up and then you've got what's left of the horsemen of life who are just kind of like hey you guys need to leave and so on and so forth this begins to shift when x-man nate gray himself shows up and this is kind of an important thing is because again nate gray in this scenario is far more powerful than he used to be they can't stop him there's no way they possibly could because his power is just on a whole different level not only that but we end up finding out in this sort of innocuous conversation that Jean Grey had with an older woman at a coffee shop, it was kind of this discussion of like, hey, like, is the earth worth saving? And it was more or less of a conversation between a mutant and a non-mutant. The difference here is that X-Man basically seized control of this old woman's body and was actually the one having the conversation with Jean. And what he got from that is earth basically sucks. Like earth is a cesspool and it's really crappy if you're a mutant. And so this is kind of an interesting thing because the stance of X-Man here is I'm doing what's for the greater good. And it's not really wrong. This world you live in basically sucks. You guys believe it's great but it's not as great as you think it is you know that because every day of your life is lived for fear of, of like the government just turning against you or humanity trying to wipe you out unless you're the avengers or the fantastic four or any myriad of superhero teams out there that are not mutants then life is okay but if you're a, if you're a mutant then life sucks and it's, it's kind of crazy here because the idea of of nate is to basically say like we're going to fix that if humanity won't fix itself then i will fix humanity for it now again this is kind of a cool thing because it leads to a little bit like at least a little introspection on, on like humanity side like as the reader it kind of gives us a little bit of a, a little bit of a moment to ask the question like is x-man right like if if the earth is going to pot and humanity won't fix it and somebody can come along who can fix it then is it okay for them to take control from humanity's hands and my my answer would be yes like humanity had its chance and it couldn't get it together so x-man's like okay fine if you can't get it together i'll get it together for you you had your chance it's really a cynical perspective but it's a cool perspective nonetheless because when the x-men make their move on on nate gray then like he immediately just incapacitates them all with them all being incapacitated and just floating there in the air unable to to use their powers or at least not able to use them effectively it shows just how outmatched they really are that x-man can do something as simple as just float them in the air and leave them there and there's nothing they can do to stop him now of course this leads to the arrival of the what are basically the new mutants kind of showing up here and it's interesting because when it came to the new mutants in marvel comics and, and again it's really these guys kind of continuing on like the old chris claremont era of storytelling when chris claremont originally launched the new mutants and they kind of stood alongside the x-men the uncanny x-men what you got was a sort of youthful perspective of the world new mutants who looked at the world and they saw it in a way where like they saw it like children do this is what the world can be not what the world is when you looked at the uncanny x-men they were kind kind of jaded for the most part like they're just kind of like yeah man the world kind of sucks and we're just taking it one day at a time but with the, the new mutants showing up here they do what the uncanny x-men did not the x-men showed up and were immediately just like okay so you have to stop nate gray and like it immediately came to blows the new mutants show up and they say we just want to talk like we want to know what you're about the problem with this is that they're dealing with nate gray and at the end of the day no matter what discussion may happen nate gray's resolve is steeled and so what this means is it's not going anywhere and the only person who really seems to realize this is legion and so in this moment legion channels what i assume is 
the Origamist, and then in turn just like sends everybody to what appears to be the Age of Apocalypse. So you basically got the New Mutants and you've got X-Men who are whisked away to this, this alternate reality. Now again, that's the kind of power that Legion possesses. Legion possesses the ability to pull off all these crazy things. Now, what this does is it kind of jumps forward a little bit and picks up with the Infinites, basically in, in Chicago, Illinois. Now, the Infinites were the soldiers of Apocalypse, if I remember correctly, and they were basically the ones who went out and like captured mutants, things like that. They really did more in terms of working directly with Sinister, but at the end of the day, they were all agents of Apocalypse anyway. But ultimately, like this group basically gets split in half. You know, you have the, the new mutants, like three of them who basically go one direction, two more go another, and it's them just trying to make their way in this world. Now, of course, they end up, you know, finally stumbling across X-Men, but we end up finding out that basically what's happened is like a huge amount of time has passed. And during this time, they've all had to do some pretty shady things in order to survive. Now, that's the nature of the Age of Apocalypse, right? The Age of Apocalypse was a universe of testing, that Apocalypse essentially set in motion a circumstance where the Earth was put in the most harsh environment it could possibly be put in, in order to be able to differentiate between the weak and the strong. Now, by this point in time, Apocalypse has long since been dead. Earth is essentially in shambles, like Earth is just in pieces and all over the place. But traveling with Nate Gray and going to Chicago, what they're doing is they're looking for the shard of the Imkron crystal. But the important thing here is that Nate Gray kind of lets his guard down. Nate Gray shows up here traveling to Chicago in this universe he thought he escaped, only to find out that it's just like a terrifying place, that it's as horrifying as he remembers it being, and that it's a hopeless place. And so when you have them basically discovering the shards of the Imkron crystal, only to find out that when they open it, the crystal essentially just kind of dissipates, turns to dust, and falls away, that's when you basically realize like there's no real escape here, at least it doesn't seem to be one. Now, Nate Gray himself is temporarily incapacitated when he's thrown inside of one of these stasis pods. And this leads to a conversation between Hisaka and Pixie. And when this discussion takes place between the two of them, it's this, I'm sorry, Hisako rather, this whole thing kind of unfolds in such a way to where Pixie makes the case that we basically have like X-Man in a weakened form here. It's bad form to kick a guy when he's down, but it's not really bad form to do that when he threatens to destroy like everything you know and love. And like any measure of a father or of a husband, you do whatever you have to to keep your family safe, even if that means like helping somebody else finish with all their living. And in this instance, it's literally what, his, what, what Pixie's saying is like, we've got this guy defeated, let's just kill him. Like if we, if we kill him here and now, and we find a way out of this universe, he can't destroy our own. And it's, it's a, it's actually a pretty legitimate argument. We're literally going to spare hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people by killing this one guy now. It's a small sacrifice. And so we're under normal circumstances. Hisako probably would have said, no, 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 that's unreasonable. Like they're literally in, in, in this alternate reality. They see how bad things can get. And so the response is, yeah. It's the smart decision to make. And so literally Hisako like goes to kill X-Man Nate Gray. And it's kind of crazy to see that whole thing unfold. Like, like you wouldn't, you would not expect that to take place. Now, the other half of this deals with the fight going on in, in the main Marvel universe itself. And again, like it's just kind of the four horsemen of life facing off against, you know, the X-Men proper and they're defeated quick, fast and in a hurry, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of this conflict going on. Kitty Pride finally shows up. She's basically freed alongside Senator Allen, but then the group is met with the arrival of Apocalypse. Now, this is a very big thing. And this group reacts exactly the way you would expect them to because apocalypse is an opportunist in every single circumstance no matter what's going on apocalypse will be your ally up until he's not up until he sees a chance to implement his plan for world domination and then he'll turn against you in a heartbeat and that's the nature of his character it's, it's what he's always done it's one of the things that make him such a cool villain and that's the reason why the x-men are walking on eggshells here of like well it's apocalypse okay let's kill him like let's be done with it <laughs> now the, the, the one of the big issues here is that i feel like brisson and rosenberg and kelly really kind of downplay the power of apocalypse and the reason why i say Say that is because when this happens, when Apocalypse kind of makes a response to saying, look, there's no reason to argue here. What's basically going on is that you, you essentially have like Legion who seems to somehow be tied into all of this. You have like all the children of the X-Men who are in this alternate reality. I guess the, the young X-Men in the alternate reality, you've got X-Men out there. None of you guys can defeat X-Men, but like killing Legion is the key to like stranding them there because so long as Legion is alive, because he's the one that sent them there, Legion seems to be the way by which they can come back. So kill Legion. And so Apocalypse just like runs up on him to literally destroy David Holler and the rest of the X-Men respond. But the problem with this is that Jean Grey by herself is able to basically overpower Apocalypse and like subdue him. That should never happen. And the reason why is because of just how powerful he is. I mean, maybe Apocalypse has just like been decreased in power over the years in kind of subtle ways I just haven't noticed. But as far as I'm aware, Apocalypse is just like a force of nature, right? Like he's just a plague sweeping across the world. And the X-Men, like a full contingent of the X-Men and X-Factor and even the Inhumans, even at their best, could not defeat Apocalypse all at the same time. The, uh, he's just that powerful. 
powerful and that capable. So I feel like this is really, really being downplayed here, which is not the worst thing ever, but it does kind of raise some eyebrows of why they would necessarily go in that direction. Now, again, you know, it's just kind of circumstances unfolded. This does kind of kind of come out of the previous events where Apocalypse was depowered for a time, you know, the, the little backup features and so on and so forth. So again, with the direction things are going in, it may just be that Apocalypse is not at his traditional full level of power. And if he is, that's fine. But nonetheless, you know, Bishop basically is the one who, who kind of comes in, tells Betsy Braddock, like, use your psychic dagger, penetrate my mind and the mind of David Holler, create a link and put me in David's mind. And that's when you end up finding out that what's going on here in this universe that they're in is not actually the, the age of Apocalypse. Instead, what's happened here is Legion has, has literally pulled him into his own mind. And that's one of the things to bear in mind when it comes to David. It's his mind is is a veritable army of personalities. I mean, it's it's thousands and thousands of personalities, but he's got his own, like, essentially his own universe inside of his own head. And so being yanked into that, like, he can change the universe in anything he wants to. In this instance, he knows that X-Man comes from Age of Apocalypse. He knows that universe is the one thing Nate Gray fears the most. And so his response is, yank them all into his mind and then throw them into what appears to be the Age of Apocalypse and then just kind of let it go from there. And so with Bishop showing up here, stopping Hisako from killing X-Man, then the response is, well, hey, like, there's always a better way, so on and so forth, yada, 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 you know, that general general hippie talk and then that turns into like Nate Gray realizing that because Bishop looks the same as he did before he arrived in here that this is not an actual universe that nine months have not actually passed here only five minutes has actually passed in the main Marvel universe but Nate Gray picks up on that immediately now this is when we really get to see the power of Nate Gray and the reason is because when you're talking about somebody being pulled into the mind of Legion I mean it's essentially just a countdown to when you die right like you're just biding your time until like the end of your life that's really all it is because you're talking about like one of the most powerful beings in existence with thousands of persons personalities, each one having a power of its own, some of which are the same, some of which are different. But you would think X-Man Nate Gray being yanked into the mind of Legion would be hopeless. Like there'd be no way for, for Nate Gray to, to, to respond to that. And the answer is nope, that's not the case at all. Because where David basically says like, you're in my mind now, I can do anything in this world. This is this is, this is is essentially my universe. I have total control over this reality. The response of X-Man is no, you don't either. And the reason why is because what he does is literally take over the mind of Legion in its entirety, seizes control of, of Legion's brain, seizes control of all all of Legion's personalities and then re-manifest in the main Marvel Universe. And so what you're basically dealing with here is insane. This is X-Man Nate Gray with all of his powers, a uh, beyond Omega level telepath and telekinetic combined with all the powers of David Holler and access to all the personalities of Legion and all their powers. The guy's a veritable god now. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.